Good morning and uh, welcome to, I suppose it's day three, uh, lecture five uh, this morning and lecture six this afternoon. Now, in this part of the course I want to move on towards priority setting and how, how economic, economics, health economic methods can assist or inform the setting of priorities. Um, first of all, though, we should... Uh, today's picture. This is a, is a rather famous picture. Um, it was Edvard Munch, a Norwegian artist who... Um, a bit like uh, Kusama Yayoi, repeated themes. Uh, each picture is not different, it's sort of related. And this is, of course, called The Scream. And this, I, I, was, I was in uh, Oslo about two weeks ago at the Research Council for Norway, where I was doing some reviewing for them. And a bus went past with... <laughs> this is a bus, you can just... Well, you may not know that's a, a, a light. <laughs> but it's part of the bus. And I thought, yes, for some people, the idea of using economics in priority setting brings on a scream because, as I touched on in the first lecture, there's a view that perhaps applying economics in the context of healthcare decision making is somehow wrong or unfair, or indeed some people would say unethical. And I just remind you, in, in, in that lecture, I ended by making the argument that I thought it, it was the other way around. It's unethical not to consider economic aspects. Now, I'm choosing my words carefully here, unethical not to consider. I'm not saying you must use economics and the economics somehow takes your decision because it doesn't or it shouldn't. Uh, the other reason for the scream here is I am going to sort of teach you a little bit of economics this morning. Now, uh, I know for some of you that will bring on the, the, that inner scream, but we'll try and make it painless, okay? And so, in this lecture, what I'm, I'm really looking at is why we can't just leave it to the market. For many things in life, Food, bicycles, motor cars, hotels, accommodation, uh, holidays. We, we don't look to the government or government agencies to make decisions for us. We just get on and do things. And uh, we seem happy enough with the, with the results. But, so what I want to talk about in this lecture is why, a number of reasons why we may not be happy to leave things to the marketplace for, in healthcare. And that then sets up this afternoon's lecture, which is if you're not going to use the market, how are you going to take decisions? And that ties back to my argument in the first lecture. I think it's unethical not to consider the economics. And so in the afternoon, we'll take a couple of examples. We'll return to hepatitis C, uh, directly acting antivirals, and also um, we'll look at some of the new treatments for non-small cell lung cancer. And I'll try and show you how health economists have tried to approach uh, the issues. So that's what we're going to cover. It's quite a lot to cover, but we'll, we'll manage. And we'll still have plenty of time for comments, questions, observations. Well, under a number of assumptions, if markets are functioning perfectly, they will produce optimal outcomes. They are wonderful the creatures, the market. Seemingly without any effort or energy or resource, people coming together, people selling things, people d demanding, purchasing goods, services, coming together, the market almost magically produces a set, of, if it's functioning well, a set of outcomes which you might describe as optimal or cannot be improved upon. 
Now, if that's the starting point, and that's, that's where economists start, a belief in markets, the functioning of markets, why do most governments intervene? And when I say most, it's probably all governments, to some extent, intervene in the markets for healthcare. Sometimes they completely replace the market. Sometimes they'll ha allow a private market to coexist alongside um, very regulated provision of, of health care. Well, in order to understand this, we have to understand, first of all, um, why markets might fail. Why markets might fail to give us good outcomes. Because if, if we were pretty convinced the market would work and give us good outcomes, why bother intervening? Why go to all the effort having large ministries of health and welfare or You've got labour in your title as well. We have Department of Health. Why do we have these big structures, many, many agencies involved? Why not just leave it to the market? And this is what we're going to find out um, now. So what is a market? Well, a market takes many forms. Uh, of course, we think sometimes of a traditional market, a sort of marketplace with lots of stalls and individual individuals with the goods laid out, selling them, people coming by, examining them, looking at them, asking the price, going next door to another provider, asking, seeing what they've got, seeing what their price is. Well, that's a, that's a traditional market, but of course they've evolved and we get now quite sophisticated markets, many where people never meet, uh, perhaps all taking place online. But all markets have the same essence, and what they are doing is they are a, a forum, a mechanism, whereby quantities and prices that are going to be supplied and demanded are, are formed. Now, markets are potentially highly efficient. Uh, potentially a great way of organising economic activity. And I suppose as evidence for that, I could just point to all around us, so many parts of our human existence, we seem to be quite comfortable leaving things to the market. Now, it seems to be so efficient because it coordinates all the independent activities of all the many um, consumers, the purchasers, um, of all the providers or suppliers of goods and services, it seems to coordinate their activities, as I say, almost costlessly. And the way it does this is the prices that are set by the market, the quantities that are bought and sold, act as signals to the participants. Now, of course, there are alternatives to markets. You, one alternative is some sort of central planning where a government or government departments or agencies determine quantities, determine prices. But any of these alternative systems are likely to be much more costly to operate. Now, I am talking about markets that function well. And in order for markets to function well, there are a number of assumptions that we require. And I won't go through them all, but I'll highlight some of them. Perhaps, perhaps the most important one is something called atomistic competition. The idea is that any particular supplier of, of goods or services, it's called a firm, any particular firm makes up only a small part of the overall supply. They are just a small part of the total that's being supplied. The implication of their being a small part is that they are what we call price takers. Any one firm, any one individual cannot choose the price independently of everybody else because they're such a small part of the market. Another assumption we usually make is firms are trying to maximize profits. Um, that doesn't seem a very strong assumption but actually, there are other things firms might choose to maximise. Um, they might try to maximise their size because the owner likes 
to be on top of a big firm rather than a nearly big firm. I don't know. But generally speaking, we're assuming there's a, some ma profit maximization motive driving decisions. Now, a very important assumption, and of course, this has a direct link in to um, healthcare. We assume that consumers are well informed. And in the marketplace, this means that they are able to find the lowest price. Or when they see a price, they can identify, is it the lowest price? Or could I do better somewhere else? Or not? Um, more than that, they're able to judge the quality of what they're purchasing. Now, we probably like to think that when we're shopping for food or something, we're not too bad at this. You know, we pick up the avocado, squeeze very gently, is it almost ripe or not? Uh, sometimes just by looking at something or by its smell, we can say, yes, this is good quality or, well, it's not such good quality, and we can allow for that. Of course, healthcare, and m many of you have medical training, even those with medical training, it's not an easy task to assess quality of healthcare. As a researcher, it's not an easy task either to assess quality. What about the consumer, or sometimes call them patients? How easy is it for them to know when they're getting good health service or less good health service? And so there's a, an early signal why maybe the marketplace isn't going to be satisfactory or entirely satisfactory for allocating health care because the sort of information that we require or we assume for a market to function well, that information may be lacking. And I'm not even talking here of some patients who have, shall we say, diminished decision-making capacity. I'm thinking here of patients who are able to make decisions perfectly well in many aspects of life, but when it comes to healthcare, they find it harder. We also assume that consumers try to maximize utility. Well, what does that mean? Simply that as individuals, when they choose A or B, they choose what they believe will be best for them. That might be a less strong assumption. Um, there's an issue sometimes we choose what's good for somebody else. But when we're consuming goods or services ourselves, doesn't seem a very strong assumption that we're trying to get what's best for us. Um, another, and this is an important assumption, and this will tie back into social capital, which of course we've been discussing for a couple of days. Uh, there are no externalities. Now I'll, I'll explain externalities more fully in a minute, but an externality in brief is a situation where my action in possibly consuming a particular good has consequences for me but it also has consequences for other people and when I take my decision I'm not adequately reflecting the consequences for others that's basically what an externality is but I'll say a bit more about it um, we don't need externalities to have perfect competition but we do need externalities if competitive markets are to give us these um, optimal outcomes. So, a little bit, that's that bit. Um, market um, demand curve is simply the summation of all the individual demands. So, if we're thinking of the market for anything, the size of that market can be captured by the demand curve. It shows a relationship between price and the quantity that people want to purchase. The market demand curve is just the sum of all the individual demands that different households or individuals have. And so the market demand curve shows um, at each price what quantity will be demanded. And the key thing here is with very few exceptions, very few exceptions, we expect 
larger quantities to be demanded at lower prices. So if the price falls, we expect demand to rise. And this is what gives us a downward sloping demand curve from left to right. Supply curve, well, the supply curve, um, well, for firms in a competitive market, they're price taking. So what they have to decide is, given the price they, they, can, they can obtain for their good or service, what quantity do they want to provide? That's their decision. And that gives us a supply curve for the firm. As the price rises, we expect firms to want to supply more. It comes back to profit maximization. And so we get an upward sloping supply curve from left to right. Um, we can explain this a bit more fully in terms of all sorts of economic concepts which we don't need to go into, uh, diminishing marginal productivity and things like that. But a firm, if it's profit maximizing and it's a price taker, it chooses the quantity, how many the quantity of services to provide or quantity of goods, it chooses the quantity where price is equal to marginal cost because that maximizes profit. But we, we, we don't need all that. We just, I just, it's just irresistible for me to say there is reasons why I can assert that we expect upward sloping supply. So, decision on what output to supply. Now, if a firm has some market power, we sometimes call it a monopolist if it's a single seller, if it has some market power, it ceases to be a price taker and becomes a price setter. So if it's large enough relative to the market, it no longer has to follow the market, accepting the price in the market, it can choose the price. So for example, just trying to think of, um, I'm, I see an Epson projector in front of me. Now I don't know what size of the market for projectors Epson has, but I suspect it's large enough that it has a degree of market power. It doesn't just have to see what price is established in the market and follow that price. It can choose what price it wishes to charge. The implication of this is quite important. If you can set your own price, you've now got a choice about what quantity to sell. You could set a high price and sell a bit less in terms of quantity, or you could set a lower price, sell a bit more. Now, that's different from the price taker who simply is given a price and they choose um, what level of quantity will maximize their profit. They choose the quantity. For this power monopolist in the extreme case, or just in general for a firm with market power, it's now got a different decision. It's got price and quantity it can choose. And so what it has to look at is the marginal revenue. Um, it's the change in the revenue, change in the, if you like, the income it's getting, or the money it's getting from selling goods. It's the change in their income or revenue as they sell an additional unit. But to sell an additional unit, you have to lower your price. Um, this has a consequence that marginal revenue is less than price. Um, let's consider a very simple case, if it helps, sometimes it does, a graphical case. This, it, let's assume that, uh, there's, uh, that first of all, there is a, the, the, it is a competitive industry. So we've got atomistic competition, we've got lots and lots of individual providers. Just to remind you why I'm doing all this, I'm doing all this to explain why markets are so wonderful before I then point out why they don't work in healthcare. I think we have to do it that way around, otherwise it's me or anybody else just asserting markets are not a good way to allocate things, we must do it with, with more regulation. Um, this could represent the supply curve for the, for the industry if it, was a, if it was a competitive industry, lots of individual suppliers and as the price rises they begin to 
supply a bit, want to supply more into this marketplace. And so if we add together all the quantities they wish to supply, um, it could give us this curve. Higher price, greater quantity. Um, sorry, I should say, but it's so much in the sort of mother's milk of economists. We do have mothers. We're not as evil as that, as not having mothers. Um, Q is quantity. Yeah, and P is price. So I should say that. And the demand curve, um, high price, a bit less demanded. As the price falls, more demanded. And so what we expect, and I'll explain this again in a minute, we would expect to end up at this point here, where at this particular price, call it P star, the amount people want to demand, which we can read off here, Q star, is just equal to the amount firms want to supply. You can read off the supply curve, Q star. Right. Now, if we have a monopolist, a single seller, this is actually interesting in terms of language. We'll tend to talk about he, which is strange language. Why not she? It's a bit like when we, t well, may not be quite the same, but we talk about God and we often, or in some countries, I have to recognize it's not the same everywhere, we talk about God as a he. And uh, of course, she, we all know she's a she. No, I don't. Anyway, excuse my language, I'm not trying to be, I would like to be gender neutral. So, the monopolist, they, <laughs> they face all the demand curve, it's all theirs, they've no other, nobody competing with them. And so, they don't just have to go to a price like P star, or any price, they can choose any price they like, but that will imply different quantities that they can sell. <coughs> now the implication of this is, if, they want, if they're up here with a high price and they want to sell a bit more, they have to lower the price. And that means for each additional unit they sell, they're getting a smaller increase in revenue, uh, we call it the marginal revenue, than the price they were charging because they have to lower the price to sell the next unit. So it has the implication that the money they're receiving, or the change in total revenue, is, down, is given by this downward sloping demand curve, um, downward sloping marginal revenue curve. And so the profit maximizing point for a monopolist is that point where the addition to costs, their marginal cost, is just equal to additional, addition to revenue, their marginal revenue. And at that point, QM, they maximize profits. Now, this has, a, this has a, a familiar ring to it. The idea that monopolists charge high prices. Because compared to the competitive situation of P star, we've got a higher price here, PM. So what the monopolist does is restrict the quantity, and that pushes up the price. Uh, this is rather bad for society arguably, um, because we have a, something called a deadweight loss. Now, this demand curve is it's, it's, it's showing what people are willing to pay to get the good or service. Uh, so you can imagine the area under the demand curve is the, is the amount of benefit that people are getting. So if we're at a, if we're at a small quantity um, being purchased, um, the people who, well, not too small, a small quantity here, the people who make up this part of the demand curve, the people purchasing it, they value this good very highly. So they're willing to pay a large amount. Once we're getting down to this part of the demand curve, the individuals making up this part of the demand curve, they're not willing to pay nearly so much they have a lower valuation. And so actually, the, the height of the curve, if you like, indicates how highly individuals value the good. 
And so the, um, if we think of all the people in this section of the demand curve, they, their valuation of the good is given by this large area here. So I'm just adding up all their willingnesses to pay. An alternative interpretation of the demand curve is your willingness to pay. And so this area represents the value to these consumers of purchasing the good. Similarly, the area under the Marshall cost curve or the supply curve of the monopolist, that represents the benefit um, sorry, the area that represents the cost they have to they have to give, they have to incur, the cost they have to incur to supply the good, they cover their costs. But that means there's another part above the cost curve, which is a surplus to the monopolist. Now, right, so retrace one. The competitive situation will have us here. The monopolistic situation will have us here. The monopolist is going to um, reduce quantity to charge a higher price. But society is going to be worse off than we were here because this area of benefit is lost. Now, we've actually lost all this benefit here under the demand curve, but we've saved these resources here under the marginal cost curve. And so this is lost. Now, it's not gone into anyone's pocket. You know, the government hasn't gained it or something like that. It's gone forever. And we actually call it a dead weight loss. And this is the simple reason why monopoly is seen as a bad idea. Now, it does get a little bit more complicated when we're thinking about the supply of new drugs because we go out of our way to make firms into monopolists. We say, we will give you patent protection for X years. We will say nobody can produce a similar drug. They are not allowed to. And so we are making monopolists. Now, there might be a good reason for that, but we, we, that would be another lecture. OK, but there's a deadweight loss, so monopoly, bad idea. Question, yes? Uh, I may have missed uh, what you just said, but uh, what does the M stand for? Sorry, marge, I, you didn't miss it. I forgot to say it. Marginal benefit. Oh, okay. So we can look upon a demand curve as the quantity demanded at each price, but it's also showing us the marginal benefit. It's showing how much, that con how much benefit the consumer gets from that unit of the good or service. Marginal benefit. Thank you for pointing that out. OK, so this is just putting it in words, which might be easier for some people. Some people like pictures. Um, monopolist is an incentive to restrict output, push up prices compared to the competitive market. It's not efficient, or what we say allocatively efficient, because at the at at the level of output that the monopolist chooses, the marginal benefit from additional units exceeds the marginal cost. So at the point the, the, the monopolist chooses, the marginal cost to society, the, the goods, the time, the inputs that are used up to produce the next unit is given by this amount here. The marginal benefit, the next consumer who gets a unit, values it up here. And so that's why it's a bad allocation from society's point of view. Because if we were here and we moved increased output and moved to the competitive solution, we would gain this blue area. So that's why, it, because at this point, the marginal benefit is just equal to the marginal cost. If we produce even more and we go we go out here somewhere, well then the marginal benefit is now below marginal cost. And so it's inefficient in the other direction. Only at this point here do we have the two equal. 
Are you feeling that inner scream yet? Hmm? Right, let's hope not. Okay, right. Um, there's various things we can do. Sometimes we introduce price controls. Sometimes we break up monopolists, um, sometimes. Um, sometimes we give people, we sell people the right to be a monopolist. And that's a way of trying to capture back some of the, the benefit. So, market equilibrium. So, equilibrium is where the quantity demanded by all the consumers at a particular price is just equal to the quantity firms want to supply. If there's an excess demand, if at that price the total demand is greater than the supply, that's excess demand, that would act as a signal to producers that there's an opportunity to make money by selling some more, um, in particular by raising price as well, the signal. In, and if there's an excess supply, if producers find they can't sell all their goods, they, it acts as a signal to lower the price. Now this may not c c cross culturally, um, but it's a good example in England would be go into a supermarket in the early evening and they will be cutting the price of bread because of course bread is fairly time limited uh, not, some breads are fairly time limited and if they find they've got, still got a lot of bread on the shelf and it's getting later in the evening they anticipate they're going to have to throw it away so that's a situation of excess supply too much bread so then they lower the price. Uh, Too much bread or the consumers are waiting for that. Well, of course, consumers become quite educated. Um, and this is why, for selling bread, we are happy to let consumer leave it to the market. Some consumers, uh, I have to say myself included sometimes, will time our arrival, or will try and time our arrival, um, to capture the, the bread at the lower price. Because there's no guarantee, how often do you do that and there's no bread left? So it's a um, tricky decision. But the point, my point here is the unsold bread is acting as a signal. Similarly, if you're selling something and there's a queue of people outside trying to wait to purchase it, or a, or a waiting list for something, that's a signal of excess demand. Okay. Um, Price will rise, we predict, when there's excess demand and will fall when there's excess supply. So now these are just stylized curves, demand supply curve. They don't have to be exactly this shape. Um, it's just if you're drawing things in PowerPoint, it's a lot easier to go with, go with the curves that are readily available. But they, they have that feature, a demand curve, higher, downward sloping to the left, supply curve upwards sloping to the right. So that would be a situation of equilibrium. If the price was P star, the quantity demanded would equal the quantity supplied. If, on the other hand, we found ourselves at price P1, in this market, the quantity demanded would be quite a lot less than the quantity that people want to supply. And so we have excess supply. This could be the bread on the shelves in the early evening. And, well, we then expect producers might lower price because as they lower price, demand will increase. And we begin to eliminate the excess supply. Similarly, if we were down in this situation, if the price was happened to be P2 and we had these supply and demand curves, there'd be an excess of demand. This is the queue, um, the waiting list perhaps, I wonder if there's a waiting list for the iPhone 8. There might be, I'm not sure. Uh, we can think of that. Um, we have waiting lists for um, kidney transplants, for example. But not a great example because we don't tend to use prices um, to allocate these things. Okay, so um, this is how a market works. And it, um, if, if we've got excess supply, if we've got excess demand, we expect 
the signal that people get will help us move to, back towards the equilib equilibrium with price at the price, quantity demanded equals quantity supplied. Right, now these equilibrium, this, this sort of point here, um, they are what we call um, Pareto optimal or Pareto efficient. Jargon doesn't matter. The meaning is this. If we're in this position, this market equilibrium, it's impossible to make one person better off without making someone worse off. That's what we mean by Pareto efficient. Impossible to make one person better off without making someone worse off. And that seems, or that's argued, of course it's an ethical, judgmental issue, to be a good thing. If you're in a position where you can't make anyone better off without someone becoming worse off, you can see how in some sense that's quite a good position. Much better than being in a position where by making this change we could make someone better off without anyone being worse off. Um, almost I, yes, I have to introduce another concept. Marginal rate of substitution. Now this, which gets abbreviated to MRS, this is the, the rate at which an individual is willing to give up one good in order to get units of another good. So imagine you've got two things that you value, you, so they're good, good things for you to have. The marginal rate of substitution tells us if you're going to give up a unit of one of the things you value, how much of the other one, how much, what increase would you require of the other one? I've got a simple example coming up which I hope will get the idea across. Marginal rate of transformation, abbreviated MRT, measures the rate at which the economy is able to produce less of one thing and with the resources released, more of something else. So the MRT, marginal transformation, is telling us about how well the, how the economy functions in terms of being able to combine inputs to produce outputs. The MRS, marginal substitution, is about people's preferences, people's values. Marginal transformation is about the, the ability of the economy to produce different combinations of goods or services. Right, suppose the marginal rate of substitution is not equal to marginal rate of transformation. The two things are not equal. Now it's going to get very easy now. You may get hungry, but at least this part should be an easier part of the lecture. That's an apple, that may be obvious. Um, this, what may be less obvious here is what this is. Um, it's chocolate, wrapped up in gold paper. Um, I think the gold paper is incidental and the heart shape is incidental. Although there's a subliminal thing about loving chocolate, I think. Right, suppose that this represents the marginal rate of substitution of the consumer. So suppose for the individual the marginal rate of substitution is equal to one. That means if they were going to give up an apple, eat one less apple, they would need to be compensated with one more chocolate. So, it's, I'm a, so I, now the marginal substitution doesn't have to be one. For some people, it could be ten. You know, if I'm going to give up an apple, lovely green crisp apple, I need ten chocolates to compensate me. For some people, it could be point one. I'll give up an apple as long as you give me, or I'll give up ten apples as long as you give me one chocolate. So that's to do with people's preferences. I'm just to keep our example simple. Let's assume it's equal to one. So marginal rate of substitution here, one for one. People are willing to give up an apple if you can compensate them with one chocolate. Let's suppose, however, the marginal rate of transformation is equal to two. And by that we mean society could produce two additional chocolates by giving up or cutting back production of apples by one. 
So the modulated transformation, two for one. Now, this situation would not be optimal in the sense that it can be improved on. We can do better than this. How do we do better than this? We produce fewer apples. Because every apple less we produce, I need a chocolate to compensate someone who's losing their apple. But according to this, my economy is such, the technology, the inputs available, knowledge, etc., is such that the resources freed in producing apples allow me, for each apple, less apple I produce, to produce two chocolates. I only have to compensate the person with one chocolate. So, just the opposite of our dead weight loss, we've got an additional chocolate as if from nowhere. And that, in more technical terms, is simply because, simply because the marginal rate of substitution is not equal to the marginal rate of transformation. There's the opportunity to do better. And another way of doing it, um, again, I don't know if it helps, but if it does, quantity of chocolates on the vertical, sorry, and quantity of apples on the horizontal. Um, this curve here, we would call, uh, uh, so much jargon, production possibility frontier. It's showing the ability of the economy to produce combinations of different goods. In this case, apples and chocolates. So this economy, given our knowledge, given our um, available inputs, resources, we could produce all of these combinations of chocolates and apples or anything below it. What we can't do, we can't produce up here. Up here, the combination of um, apples and chocolate, we don't have enough resources to produce up here. So we can produce here. Well, the marginal rate of transformation in the economy is given by the slope of this frontier. Because the slope is showing, as we produce less chocolate, how much more apples we get. So it's a marginal rate of transformation. Similarly, we, have, we call it a social welfare frontier. We can imagine a curve that is showing what people value, the different combinations of chocolate and apple, that they are of, of equal value to them. And so there's lots of these curves. We can imagine other curves down here, which where society is less well off, they're on a lower social welfare frontier, and we can imagine other curves higher up. But the point is, given our technology, given our available resources, the welfare, social welfare frontier that we can, highest one we can get to, is this one. And that point here, we're just able to reach this higher frontier. If you imagine the next higher, the next one up, it's outside of our production possibilities. We can't get there. You can imagine ones down here. Well, we can achieve that, but why, why do that? Why not do more? Why not achieve something better for our society? And so we achieve it at the point of tangency between the two curves. And of course, that point, well, maybe not of course, where the slope of the production possibility frontier is equal to the slope of the social welfare frontier, the marginal rate of transformation is equal to the marginal rate of substitution. And we can't do any better. It doesn't matter how we, re we consider more chocolate or less apple, we can't do better than that. Now, um, I'll be very brief on this bit. Given the assumptions that we make about um, firms being price takers, maximizing profits, given assumptions about consumers being well enough informed so they know when it, they've, met, they've encountered the lowest possible price, etc. then a competitive market will get you to that point. It will 
and I'm not going to demonstrate this because it would take too long, it will set prices such that you end up here. You end up in your best possible place. And that is why um, it's allocatively efficient. That's why economists love markets. Because if all these assumptions are fulfilled, leave it to the market. Markets should get you to this best of all place. But of course, markets can fail. One example might be we have price setting and not price taking. In other words, monopoly, which I, I showed you. Another example is externalities. And another example is public goods. And I'm going to move on to talking about them in a minute. Another way in which markets fail is we have imperfect information. Um, touched on one example of this in the very first lecture was supplier inducement. Remember this idea of a, an asymmetry or imbalance of information between healthcare providers and patients or consumers. That's imperfect information. Uh, another potential problem, this happens in health insurance, among other areas, something called adverse selection and something called moral hazard. But I haven't, again, that's a, that's a whole lecture in itself. Um, so there's these reasons why markets can fail. Uh, let's look at externalities. Now, maybe we get on firmer ground here, get a little bit near public health, seem appropriate uh, where we are. Um, good example of, of uh, a positive externality is vaccination. A vaccination. Um, an example of a negative externality would be air pollution. Or again, moving closer, maybe closer to public health, or even closer to public health, passive smoking. Although I think air pollution is probably pretty close to public health, or it should be. Uh, let me explain these. Right, with a positive externality, too little of the activity is undertaken. There's not enough of it. At the private equilibrium, at that point that we'll get to, if we just leave it to the market and just leave it to individual decisions of consumers and producers, the marginal social benefit is greater than the marginal social cost. In other words, we've got an opportunity by doing a bit more to get some additional benefit and enough additional benefit to compensate us for the additional cost, or more than compensate us. Uh, an example of this might be because the marginal social benefit of an activity exceeds its marginal private benefit. Now, this would be the example in vaccination. Uh, with an externality, on the other hand, we've got too much of the activity happening. Too much is, again, at, at the private equilibrium. If we just leave it to firms, individuals, we don't regulate the market. A negative externality will have too much of the activity. Uh, at the private equilibrium, the marginal social benefit is less than the marginal social cost. And so that last unit of activity is producing, if you like, more harm than benefit, and thus making us worse off. One example might be the marginal social cost exceeds the marginal private cost. So for example, um, a firm producing some sort of manufacturing output doesn't just produce the units of the output, but they also produce waste products, which either they release into water courses or they release into the air. Now, what's happening is they are thinking, when they look at their private marginal cost, they're thinking of how much they pay the employees to work a bit more, how much additional units of raw material they need, how many more machines, etc., they require. But they're also, because they're producing these waste products, they're imposing another cost on everybody else in terms of air pollution. And that's part of the social cost, but it's not part of their private cost. They're not thinking about that. So that's, that's the problem. And so they push the activity too far. 
because they haven't taken account of all the costs. I can give you another, another graph. Um, positive externality, again, higher price, greater quantity supplied, lower price, um, greater quantity demanded. So um, imagine an individual who's thinking about, suppose we're looking at the queue here could be vaccinations. So individuals are making decisions, if we left it all to the market, individuals would look at the price of a vaccination, obtaining a vaccination, they would think, what's the benefit to themselves of a vaccination? Now, if the price was very high, some people would get vaccinated. They would think, yes, this is worth it. I want to protect myself, but, but not so very many. At lower prices, more people would choose to be vaccinated. But the point here is they're thinking, we argue, of their marginal private benefit. They're thinking of the protection the vaccination gives them. But of course, every time one of us is vaccinated, while we benefit, in principle, we give a benefit to other people. And uh, you, giving your background, you'll be familiar with notions of herd immunity and things like that, which uh, I won't go into. And so the marginal benefit to society, the marginal social benefit, from vaccination is up here somewhere. It's above the private benefit. Because there's a benefit to the, per the private individual getting the vaccination, but there's then also a benefit for other people. And so the marginal social benefit is higher than the marginal private benefit. And so rather than um, being at this point here with a, with a price PE and QE quantity, it would be better for society to expand the activity out to Q star. And at Q star, the marginal benefit from the last person vaccinated is just equal to the marginal cost of supplying the vaccination. So that's an example of positive externality. And the relevance here is, if we leave it to the market to determine, we expect to end up at QE, or somewhere like QE, not at Q star. Goodness me, I'm going too slowly. <laughs> but we've got time for questions. Come on. Any questions about this? Or is this a bit blindingly obvious? Okay, well, hold on to that. Let's hope it's... The danger here is, because you're quiet, it's rather than being absolutely obvious and simple, you're feeling a bit lost and... Uh, okay. Yes. Ooh. All right. So, um, well, cost benefit, cost utility, cost effectiveness are different methods of economic evaluation. And the difference, I realize this is for everyone's benefit, not just for you, I realize you realize this. The difference is um, with cost benefit, you're valuing the benefits in money terms. With cost utility, you're valuing it in terms of maybe qualities gained or dallies prevented. With cost effectiveness, you're using some sort of more physical measure, like um, myocardial infarctions prevented or hip fractures prevented. Um, I think it's fair to say that from an economist's point of view, life would be sort of almost easier if we were able to put money values on the various benefits uh, for various reasons. For one reason, it's then easier to compare to the costs because they're in the same denomination. It's also then easier to make comparisons between activity in the health sector 
and in other sectors of the economy. However, there's a number of reasons why it's very challenging to put monetary values, money values, on health benefits. There are some methods, again that's a whole lecture, or in fact I could give you three lectures on it. There are methods, but it, there are challenges. Uh, I think it's fair to say that health economists have, if you like, almost pushed things like cost per quality and the quality of just life here because they th probably thought they could get buy-in from the rest of the world on that. It's still a long battle, but the, the, you know, some measure of years of full health has a sort of strong intu intuition to it. If we think of intuition, for most people, the idea that you could actually say, and it's worth this much money for this person not to have a, a stroke, that makes people very uncomfortable. And I think justifiably. I, I think the justification is that um, our methods are not really quite good enough. And so we've ended up with a focus on, on measures such as qualities and dallies, whereas perhaps it might be beneficial in some senses if we had money values for these benefits. I don't know if that sort of answers your point. And when I'm talking about these curves, of course, this is a money value. I'm talking about how much is someone willing to pay for a vaccination or for the health benefit that a vaccination brings. Okay. Um, negative externality, well, we don't have to spend a lot of time on this, but same idea. What's happening with the, in, the, in the opposite direction, what's happening is the, the producer is thinking of their private costs, and so we have a decision to produce at QE, but perhaps there's not just private costs in, involved, perhaps there's costs imposed on other people, uh, the example of air pollution, in which case the, the cost, marginal social cost, cost of society of the activity is not down here, it's up here somewhere. And so if the producer was then to take into account their impact on society, well then we would expect them to um, produce less. Uh, back to our smoking example. If you leave it, the, the producer here is the individual smoker, if you leave it to them, they will be, by and large, thinking of how much they are enjoying or whatever that next cigarette. They may not be thinking, and what impact am I having on those around me? Uh, if they thought about the impact on those around them, they might not have that cigarette. Um, and so, if we leave it to the market, we have too much smoking. Hence, we have all sorts of policies about trying to restrict smoking uh, that different governments have, have introduced. So there is, I hope you get, there's a, so quite a strong read across from these theoretical concepts to actual real policies and real decisions. Um, there's sometimes arguments that there's, there's actually a very special sort of externality in healthcare, and that's a caring externality. It's suggested that some individuals may feel better off knowing that other individuals are getting health care that they need. So we may not just be concerned with our own health and our demand for health care. We may value knowledge knowing other people have access to health care. Thus, as more health care is provided, not only does the individual who gets the health care gain, but maybe we all gain. Now, this is beginning to drift slightly back towards social capital, possibly. Uh, I'll, I'll try and tie it in more closely later. Now, this is different from the vaccination example. Um, if more people are vaccinated, I am actually gaining. This example is other people get access to health care and I'm just feeling better off because I've got that knowledge. 
Now, we don't have a lot of evidence of this, but there have been some studies, using willingness to pay, actually, as a, a method, um, which have shown that people are willing to pay a certain amount to provide benefits to others. There's quite a famous study conducted in, um, it was southwest Nigeria, well, it was in, in Nigeria anyway, and it was looking at um, insecticide treated bed nets. And it established that there was some positive willingness to pay from individuals to improve access to insecticide treated bed nets for other people. So there are a few examples of that, but um, maybe this is just a nice idea. <laughs> maybe, it's, maybe it's not it's real, I don't know. I, I think it is real, I think it's just quite hard to provide the evidence for it. Um, well, jargon, we talk about internalizing externalities as we're getting rid of them internalizing them, um, bringing the externality internal to the decision. So making the producer think about the costs they impose on others. Um, making the, the individual who's receiving the vaccination um, think about the benefits to others. Now, or in effect, think about the benefits to others. Now, what you could do is just have a campaign and posters say, get vaccinated, save someone else's life. That might work. Easier in this context would be subsidize the price of the vaccine because then we'd expect as price or the cost to the individual getting vaccinated, as that goes down, more people get vaccinated. Or if they not just subsidize the price, just make it easier for them to get vaccinated. Um, you could have campaigns where you go to workplaces or, or whatever. So there are ways of um, internalizing externalities and one solution is either to tax the activity you the bad activity negative externality activity or to subsidize the good activity the, the positive externality and so you're ensuring that individuals firms and consumers get the right price signal because the problem here is they're getting the wrong price signal um, just now Yeah, so I won't dwell on that. That's just putting it in words. Um, there is a problem with this. What level do you set the tax at? Or what level do you collect the set the subsidy at? Um, you might over-subsidize something, and you could have too much of it. Um, and, of course, it's costly to administer such a system. Right, public goods. Now... For economists, public goods have a very specific meaning. It's got two characteristics. A good that is non-rival and non-excludable. Let's take non-rival first of all. If we say something's non-rival, we're saying that one person's consumption of the good doesn't mean there's less available for others. Now, if we go back to the apples and chocolates, apples and chocolates are rival. If I eat the apple, it's not available to you. If you eat the chocolate, it's not available to me. It's rival. On the other hand, we've got some spare seats in this room. So this lecture is non-rival. We could have additional people coming in ideally at the start, and they could consume the lecture, and there's not less lecture for the rest of you. Okay, if they really wanted to ask lots of questions, it might be begin to squeeze your opportunity to ask questions, uh, but initially it's non-rival. It could become rival, you know, if too many people came, because then uh, that would interfere with your consumption of the lecture. And the second characteristic is non-excludable. This is saying that if the good or, or service is provided for one person, it's impossible to prevent others from enjoying the benefits. Now, this lecture is excludable. It's not non-excludable. 
because you just lock the door. Or the other ways we do it, we just don't tell people it's happening. But we can prevent people. Just because you, I, I use enjoying in the sense of consuming, just because you are consuming this lecture doesn't mean the benefits of the lecture are then available to other people. Mind you, if the recording goes on online without a, a firewall or something, a payment wall, <laughs> I suppose maybe this also is non-excludable. Mm. Think about that. Um, probably it's on a sort of going to be on a Kyoto University website, in which case only members of Kyoto University will be able to access it. So you see the distinction that some goods, um, you can ex if you provide it, it's easy to exclude other people from enjoying the benefit. Other goods, if you provide it, it's very difficult to exclude um, people from enjoying the benefits. Examples of non-rival, non-excludable. A traditional one is national defence. My government invests in national defence. They can't tell, hmm, choose, your, uh, <laughs> choose your enemy. Uh, <laughs> they can't tell Germany. They can't tell North Korea. They can't tell Russia. They can't tell the United States. John Cairns is not protected, by the way. Yes, we're going to defend the country, but we're not going to defend him. Uh, so by pr providing national defence, they provide it for me as well. They can't exclude me. Um, also, by providing national defence, it doesn't, the defence protection offered to 50 million people is the same protection offered to 60 million people. There's not less defence available in that sense. So that's why there's an argument national defence is, is non-rival, non-excludable. Perhaps a more mundane example would be street lighting. If you provide street lighting, it's non-rival in that there's not less, if I, and I walk along the street, there's not less light available for other people. So it's non-rival. Also, it's pretty much non-excludable. If you're going to provide street lighting for one person, one group of people, other people can walk along the street and get the benefit. Um, that's more mundane, but more esoteric knowledge. Is knowledge non-excludable, non-rival? So if we discover something and we have new knowledge, there's not less available for other, and somebody wants, that, wants to consume that information, there's not less available for other people to consume. Non-rival, is it non-excludable? Well, generally, once we discover something, unless we're going to somehow keep it a secret to ourselves, it's quite difficult to exclude others from the benefit. Now, I do realize in some societies, things like access to internet is more restricted than others. And in a sense, that might be seen as excluding people from the benefits of knowledge. But um, in many societies, knowledge seems to have this public good characteristic. Now, public goods have a particular problem, uh, or a number of problems. One of them is called the free rider problem. It's quite difficult to provide public goods through markets because Individuals don't have to pay. If someone is being provided and is going to pay for the good, other people will be able to enjoy the benefits of the good. So um, when we describe this as free riding, it's where people try and obtain the benefit without paying the cost or contributing to the costs. <clears throat> and so that makes it very difficult, not impossible, but quite difficult for private markets or markets to provide public goods. Uh, of course, some interesting example, counterexamples. Uh, and for, for many centuries, the lighthouses around the coast of the British Isles 
uh, which are there to warn shipping of rocks and shallow water and so protect um, shipping vessels from harm. For, for many, actually, centuries, the system was run entirely privately. It wasn't government, governmentally provided. It was a private organization supplied the lighthouses. Um, now, the way they did it would be partly through contributions, well, just voluntary contributions, but also um, local communities, of course, got the most benefit from the lighthouse because that was in their area. And so there was a sort of willingness to contribute. Now, question to ask, of course, is, did we have too few lighthouses? Should we have had even more lighthouses? And we just had too few because we were relying on um, contribution just locally. But so that was an example of private organization being able to provide what would be, I think, viewed as a public good. Bottom question here is, does healthcare have public good characteristics? Well, most healthcare actually appears to be rival and excludable. I break a leg, I get it fixed. I benefit from having the leg fixed. Um, it's rival in that the time that the orthopedic surgeon spends on my leg is not available for somebody else, so it's rival. Also, it, fixing my leg sounds excludable. The hospital, maybe I don't know what would happen in Japan, but certainly in the United States, in some parts, they would check my credit card first of all. And if I didn't have a credit card, or if I didn't have health insurance, maybe they wouldn't fix my leg. So I, 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 could, uh, I could be excluded. A lot of healthcare seems like that. Not all healthcare, I mean, if we think of infectious disease, uh, protecting one, or helping one individual, protecting one individual, seem to confer benefits on others. Public um, health measures, I think, may have public good aspects. For example, um, prevention of a bird flu pandemic. There's not less protection from others if we provide protection for one group. There's not less protection available, so non-rival. And I think it's non-excludable. You know, if you protect one group, that's definitely going to protect and confer a benefit on others. Another example, this was slightly rarer, um, is disease eradication. So, um, you know, eradicating smallpox is a public good. Non-rival, non-excludable. What about social capital? <coughs> Are there externalities associated with individual investments in social capital? So if we do things in order to build up our social capital, we participate in more organizations, meetings. Um, we trust others more. If we engage in these activities, is that going to provide a benefit to others? It seems quite possible it might. We looked at some evidence showing as various measures of social capital increased, there seemed to be some positive impacts on health. Question here is, were the impacts just on the person who was investing, or is the, is the, is the health gain more general? Or one way of phrasing it might be, is community social capital a public good? Is it non-excludable? Is it non-rival? Now, as social capital builds up in a community, does seem that my or your consumption of that social capital could well be non-rival. And non-excludable. 
Now, if that is the case, that then leads to the final question. Is it likely that left to the market, too little social capital will be created? Because individuals might just be thinking of the benefit to themselves by contributing to the maintenance or development of social capital, they may not be thinking enough about the benefit they're conferring on other people. So it might well be the case that um, we should have, or there's an opportunity to benefit from some sort of governmental encouragement of social development of social capital. What do you think? Not so much should governments get involved. Let's take the prior question. If we leave it to individuals, individual firms, individual consumers, to make the decisions, will we get the right amount of social capital or will we get too little, too much? Okay, are you saying there's too many bicycles already? <laughs> you don't, don't need any more. Um, so this is an example of private organisations taking actions, incur costs themselves, which will generate this, these benefits for others. Mm -hmm. um, do they advertise on the bicycles and things like that? I, I guess they don't do it in secret. <laughs> you know, there wasn't 2,000 bikes appear overnight. Uh, and they keep quiet about it. <laughs> but okay, so that's, that's an example. So that might be an example. Yes, let's just leave it to the market. Hmm? I, think, I think the government can take that, and the environment must be taken to go to social capital. So the Yeah, because something like that, okay, individuals could come together and, as it does happen, and each contribute and over the years develop the facility. But it's not always easy. And maybe, yes, it, it, there might be a role whereby government could provide the facility, and that would be a much faster way and more effective way, maybe building things up. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I didn't put that slide in the in the <laughs> in the lecture. Sorry, in the lecture notes. It's an irritating thing lecturers do. We don't do it deliberately. But I was just looking over the notes this morning, and I thought, actually, given what I've been talking about, yes, Monday and Friday, I really should put a slide in here about this. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I just, re just remembered. Okay, so in summary, um, what have we covered? Quite a lot, actually. Uh, I tried to explain why perfectly competitive markets produce optimal outcomes. I tried to explain some of the reasons why markets fail or might fail. And I've, well, maybe I didn't put enough emphasis on this, but I should have. It may be that. Markets for healthcare are particularly prone to failure. For example, problems with information or imperfect information may be greater in healthcare markets. Um, monopoly may be much more of a common phenomenon 
if you think of, the, of hospitals, there's very few hospital markets, a few, where there are so many hospitals that effectively it's almost atomistic competition. What's well, not? They've got market power. In some communities, there may only be one hospital uh, in that locality. So monopoly might be an issue. Some parts of healthcare do seem to be characterised by externalities. And some aspects of um, health might have public good features as well. Now, there's different ways governments can respond to that. Uh, they can attempt to replace the market completely, or they can try and sort of work with the market, or they can have a dual provision. They can have a, a public health sector and a private sector. I suppose the final thing I should say is it's very important to recognise that governments can fail and not just markets. Um, so there's absolutely no guarantee that replacing markets with government actions and regulation will improve things. I think context will come into it. There are some governments that we might trust more than others to improve situations. Um, so it's very important not to just say, OK, I see why markets might be a bad idea. We've got to use taxes more. We've got to use subsidies. We've got to regulate. We've got to publicly provide. That still requires a whole series of decisions about quantities to provide, technologies to use, where to provide services. And can you be confident that some committee is going to make the decision in a, in a much better way, more effective way, than leaving it to individuals and individual organisations? Which turns me to... Um, the lecture this afternoon. In several countries, one way government is regulating health care is by making decisions over which health technologies will be used, uh, particularly around dr new drugs. Now, there's two ways in which they, at least two ways in which they strongly regulate this market. One, is to do with um, assessing the, the safety of new products. And so we have, um, I guess, ministry in Japan making some decisions there. I mean, in Europe, we have something called the European Medicines Agency. And in the United States, we've got something called the Food and Drug Administration, or FDA. So one way governments regulate is by setting up these bodies and if you're going to, in order to obtain permission to sell this new drug, you need to provide certain evidence and per persuade certain committees that the likely benefits outweigh the risks. A second way in which um, governments in several countries, and beginning to a little bit in Japan, but not a lot, um, is not just looking at the safety of the new drugs and the relationship between benefit and safety, something called risk-benefit, but they also ask, is this a good use of resources? Because in many countries, the government has, is playing a major role in providing, through the taxpayer, but the, the, the taxpayer is pay, playing a major role in financing what healthcare is provided. And the question is, um, are some of these new drugs good value for money or not? And uh, if you're not going to just leave it to individual private decisions, if you're going to replace these private decisions as to what drugs are going to be available, you need some mechanism by, by, by which you decide. And so in this afternoon's lecture, 
I'm going to talk about two examples. I'm not going to focus too much on the mechanism. I'm going to talk on, about the use of economic evaluation to inform these decisions. And there's lots of different ways you can organise the processes, but in many countries, at any rate, one element is a detailed review of evidence. And evidence, not just clinical evidence, but also evidence on cost effectiveness. And we'll look at, as I say, two examples. We'll have a, a, a look a bit at hepatitis C and a bit more at um, some of the new treatments for non-small cell lung cancer. Okay? So that's resuming at one o'clock, isn't it? Yes.